that clip from S- MSNBC talking Which about one? talking with Trump. The, the, they're going to start talking with Trump now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that one's fascinating because now yep. they're, you know, they're okay with, with a Nazi now. Last Thursday, we expressed our own concerns on this broadcast and even said we would appreciate the opportunity to speak with the president-elect himself. On Friday, we were given the opportunity to do just that. Joe and I went to Mar-a-Lago to meet personally with President-elect Trump. It was the first time we have seen him in seven years. Now, we talked about a lot of issues, including abortion, mass deportation, threats of political retribution against political opponents and media outlets. We talked about that a good bit. And it's going to come as no surprise to anybody who watches this show, has watched it over the past year or over the past decade, that we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of issues. And we told him so. What we did agree on was to restart communications. Before they weren't. Before, definitely not okay with a Nazi. But yeah, now just they're okay with a Nazi. Ago. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're okay with a Nazi, especially because... The nation has spoken. Nazis are cool. Yeah. You must talk to them yeah. now. <laughs> it's amazing how morality goes out the window when you... Your when your business model is fucked. Yeah. <laughs> I thought morality was morality, you know? Separate from money. Pretty, pretty interesting development there. Um... The vibe shift has been insane. I don't know if you've been feeling the, like, you know, I, I hear it discussed. I see it on X. You know, X, again, is like not a place to get the total vibe check from the country. But, like, the conversations on X around the election, the way the media has been covering the election now, publications like MSNBC that are hard left-leaning media platforms being receptive to Trump. We have the Trump dance becoming a cultural phenomenon with uh, NFL teams and players celebrating touchdowns with the Trump dance, right? Like that now there is like a there is like an acceptance of Trump in society in America that I haven't seen since he started running for president. I I knew it existed before he ran for president. You know he was very much like very well viewed by the public, and it seems like he's gonna. It's been a return to that sort of like quote unquote admiration or acceptance of him as a as a person or as an American sort of icon, whatever you want to call it, while running for while being president of the United States. Yeah. So what 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 does that mean? That feels like a like a pretty significant thing. It has a lot of underlying factors, you know? So I'm curious to hear your take. Well I think it's historic because it's the first time that we have seen someone at this level flip the script on the legacy media narrative assault. Like, all throughout our lifetimes up until this point, once all of the, you know, anointed sources of truth decided that you were an evil person, like you'd just be disappeared from the national conversation. And it worked. So well. Like shockingly. So many people ha- this has happened to. And whether they were, you know, business people or politicians or whatever, like once the machine decided that you were an enemy and decided to squash you, then there was not a whole lot that you could do. And now we've seen the tide really begin to shift on this over the last few years. Um, And we've seen people be able to maybe survive, but I don't think we've really seen anyone be able to just completely flip the script like that. And, And I think that is a very big and significant development. Um, So, you know, whether it's you've got your Joe Rogans who are able to kind of survive cancellation and they're just, you know, they're doing about as well as they were ever able to do. But, you know, I don't think that Joe Rogan is necessarily more popular today than he was several years ago. Probably, you know, roughly within the same vicinity of where he was. Um, 
But they lied about Trump so much, so hard for so long, and they really did just double down on their characterization of him and I think got exposed for really just being outright liars in so many different instances that finally, instead of just being able to survive, like he was able to inflict more reputational damage on legacy media in the long arc than they were able to inflict on him. How crazy and, is that? Yeah, like he called their bluff and turned pocket aces, essentially. Like it took 10 years for this to develop. That's the crazy part. Yeah. Yeah. Like, th how is this not one of the most craziest developments in recent memory? You know, the machine, the machine did everything it could to disappear this person and the machine lost. And the well, machine and had, yeah. Not just tried to disappear him, but also, and, and I think this is, you know, their ta this is where their tactic yeah. of trying to disappear people really blew up in their fla face is that then they tried to do those same things to RFK Jr. and Tulsi Gabbard and Elon, Elon in his own way. And it's just like, you yeah. know, they created this coalition of renegades. And I think it is that coalition that is even more like, you know, if it was just Trump, I think people would be, I don't think it would feel like it has such a vibe shift that mm. we feel today, you know, without RFK Jr. and the Maha movement getting incorporated into the Trump platform and that plus Tulsi Gabbard's no more insane forever wars plus Elon's let's accelerate techno utopianism like people you know it's just like an insane coalition of common sense across the board like yeah. we want to be healthy and we want technology to make our lives better and we want to stop fighting forever wars and killing you know millions of innocent people for literally no reason other than it makes some defense contractors in Washington rich such an Plus, extreme agenda isn't it such I know. an extreme agenda <laughs> yeah <clears throat> that's totally unpopular with the majority of Americans yeah <laughs> it's crazy it it really it really is crazy i think i think you called it really really correctly here is like if it was just trump if it was just trump and they said hey we need to be we need to make sure we we we're doing the right thing and actually doing our jobs with everyone else but let's 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 just lie about trump so we can disappear him but they couldn't either it's not just so much that they couldn't i just think they're the their method of operation is so outdated in this new world of information and media and independent media and the internet that their broken way of approaching information got exposed when the public realized, I think, that their ability to lie doesn't just is not just around one specific topic. It's across a multitude of topics and a multiple a multitude of people. And I think that it, it just, I feel so optimistic because of this, because of what happened, because you really got to think about the type of influence and power and money and vested interest is in the machine, like this, this media machine that was pointed at Trump, RFK, Elon, Joe Rogan, et cetera, et cetera. This is not some like hobby thing. This is not like a 5 million or 10 million subscriber YouTuber. You know, this is not Coffeezilla, Coffee uh, Zilla, Coffee Zilla, right? Like he like exposes people. He does a really good job as an independent media guy. But if he does that with Trump, it it literally has no effect cuz Trump can just be like go away. Even if even if he's right. Right? Trump can just be like go away. No one's paying attention to you. 
the 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 machine that was pointed at these people is so powerful and they lost and they lost that's insane like when is the last time a good thing has happened like this <laughs> you know it's usually where it's usually like it's usually like oh my god we got dragged into another war oh my god they lied about you know a bunch of stuff about covid oh my god you know like th there is a bunch of lies about this topic and that topic look at how they're smearing this company for no reason look at how obvious look at like i think the thing that frustrated me the most is that the media the media landscape in the united states is so obviously propaganda and everyone knew it was propaganda and it seemed like nobody could do anything about it and that was depressing like when when i when it became obvious that that a lot of media publications seem to act in that manner set aside if they actually are acting in that manner it, it, they obviously do in some respects, right? Because they just outright lie and they keep pushing the same lie. That's no different than propaganda in my, in my eyes. And it's uh, the misinformation and disinformation that they claim to be yeah. against. Like they exactly. are the primary purveyors of BS. Yeah. And they're like, hey, all you other people out there that are saying things that are <laughs> not true or or maybe they're true, but they're really inconvenient. Like, we need to be able to shut all of you guys down because it's just not okay for everyone else to have their voices <laughs> and, and say the things. That's our job. Don't yeah. step on my toes. Yeah, it's literally like, how many times were, have these people been caught with quotes saying like, hey, we will lose, like, we can't lose control. We can't lose control. And it, in my head, I'm like, why do you get to decide that you have control? Why? Number one, if you're a media comp publication... Because they live in D.C. Because they live in D.C., right. You know? Media publications, why, why do you need control? You, your job, you're a for-profit corporation whose goal is to provide a service to the public. Okay? Uh, and, and what... Like in, in what sense do you have control? You don't have control. You're just offering a service to the public and the public gets to vote with their wallet and their attention if you should get their business or not, right? And then uh, govern, government officials are representatives of the people. They are acting on behalf of the civilians and the citizens of the United States. Why do you get to have control? You don't have control. I have control. You have control. You don't have control. The people have control. So when I hear that kind of verbiage coming out of these people, I'm like, what in the fuck is happening? Right? So that entire structure, but here's my point. That entire structure is gone now. You know, in a way, right? It's just, it, it has been, it has been collapsed yeah. down in, in a, in a, it's so obviously not the thing anymore. And there's nothing more telling than that MSNBC thing that happened. I'll make sure to put the clip of that at the beginning of the video. So you all know what we're talking about at the beginning there, but. Um, that clip really highlights like if I'm an NBC viewer and I've been told that this is the worst person in the world and then they turn around and say we should probably talk to the guy because you know he extended a hand and instead of talking about it we should talk to him because that's we're journalists that's what we're, that's what we're supposed to be doing if I'm an MS M M NBC viewer I want to be like okay but what but why you told me this is the worst person ever if you're telling me this guy is literally the worst person ever how dare you extend a hand like how how does this end up? And you're like, trying to tell like me right now that Tulsi Gabbard is a Russian toady because yeah. she met with one time one person, you know, Assad, or was willing to talk to the Russian. Like she was just yeah. willing to talk to them, so therefore she must be a Russian asset. Like it's unbelievable. Yeah, the the logic obviously is non-existent. Yeah. So then the question becomes right. So here's like here's my. This is where my mentality has shifted completely from trying to prevent like trying my hardest to think about the implications of this negative outcome to thinking about the implications of this positive outcome right because pre-election the, the more i dug into it the more i dug into the state of the country the influence of media and everything that was going on especially with the birth of my first child like you know my testosterone is down it's bottomed because i'm you know uh, uh freaking um, my DNA is like, don't get aggressive around a baby. So let's lower your testosterone. I haven't, I have a test on Jan in January to get tested. I bet you it's zero. I bet you it's negative one. Just crying about everything, bro. Hopefully I don't cry on the podcast. <laughs> so super emotional. Uh, I have a child now and I'm viewing the world completely differently. I'm viewing my role to, as 
as my as the husband differently, right? I'm 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 really here to protect and I'm really here to provide, especially while we raise our child together. I'm thinking about security. I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking about my well-being, my wife's well-being, my child's well-being. And I'm like, look, and I'm like, okay, so what kind of world am I experienced? Like, am I living through this? Like, what does the future look like? And then every time I looked at it, I'm like, geez, man, we got a media landscape that lies all the time and it's lying to people constantly. I feel like they're constantly attacking the wrong thing. They're not focused on the right things. We have all these different factors. We're incredibly unhealthy. We have an out of control deficit. We have politicians that are not responsive to the people, right? A lot of negative things. We have, there's not like, where's the hope for humanity? Kind of sense, right? And then, and then after the election, and it's weird to say this because I feel like not one one singular thing happening in society, I don't think should cause this level of like a 180 in anybody, like emotionally. But I, I, it's really hard for me to escape the feeling that this outcome, regardless if you agree with it or not, has a ton of positive implications. It has a ton of positive implications. I'm sure it's not going to be perfect. One thing for sure, it's going to be chaotic as hell if they go through their policy, like what they want to get done from like a, you know, deportation perspective, from a deficit perspective, from a doge perspective, from a, a government efficiency perspective, the deregulation, uh, as many positive things that come along with that, there's always going to be negatives that come along too. And the public needs to ensure that they're very vocal about those things happening. But I can't escape the fact, the feeling that it's that for the first time that I can remember being in this country and being really involved in the future of this country, I have never felt more positive. I have never felt more positive because it feels like the country, a lot of us are on the same page that this is not working and we need drastic change, right? And, I, and I, that to me, is one of the best possible things that could have happened. And it and it and it happened. Now we have to wait and see if it actually happens. <laughs> now no. we now we need to see execution, right? I can't escape that feeling. I think I think the I just feel so damn positive about the future now. And I and I would have never in a million years thought I would be here. Like and, and I could be proven wrong. Like in, in February 2025, it's all a lie. You know, Trump institutes his his uh forever presidency and we're all you know brown people like me are in a, in a camp somewhere like the democrats told me i would be uh you know all the people in my replies on x he's going to deport you you know and i'm like i'm a u.s citizen like to puerto rico your garbage your garbage, <laughs> your garbage <laughs> island yeah. yeah they're going to deport me to garbage island even though i'm not from puerto rico right so it's like uh, it's, uh, anyway that's stupid social media rhetoric so um yeah I, I don't know i don't know if that makes any sense or if that's hyperbolic or not but that's that's truly how i feel well i think for people who are involved in watching the tesla story there are definitely some parallels you know one of the things that is inspiring and helps people to feel hopeful that go to work for elon musk is like okay we're gonna pick a big very difficult problem that is incredibly important to solve and we know it's going to be a ton of work and it's going to be incredibly chaotic and messy and it's going to hurt and it's going to involve a lot of pain, but we're actually going to solve the problem. And I feel like that is the sentiment that a lot of people now are feeling about the United States government, that we've just had this thing that was going off the rails, getting more and more restrictive to the freedoms of everyday Americans and not able to identify the right problems that actually needed focus, not able to actually make a positive difference on the right problems. Like, yeah. you know, the IRA is a good example of a piece of legislation that was, I mean, that's like one of the most positive things that I have seen come out of Washington in a long time. Yeah, but even under that, the Biden administration. And it was yeah. under the Biden administration. But when you actually step back and look at it, like, it's a half measure and it's not going to be very effective. It's at least as wasteful as it is constructive, if not more so. And the, the ability of that piece of legislation to put us on solid footing 
in Cold War 2.0 against China, it just was not going to get the job done. And Wholly Rohan, ineffective. Yeah, Rohan really did a good job of making that point in the conversation that we had. And I, don't, I just don't think that most people understand that the United States has been in Cold War 2.0 with China now for a long time, at least 10 years, probably more like 20. Um, and we didn't realize it. And we got caught flat-footed. And they went out and took an early lead. And we are now in the position of really having to play catch up. And the challenges that we're going to have as a nation over the next couple of decades in trying to regain our competitive footing are immense. And, you know, this was one of the things that Trump was really early on. And uh, he, raised the the flag on the fact that hey like we can't just do business as usual with china where we call this economic relationship that we have with them free trade when it's not really free trade at all it's completely lopsided like they tariff our things when we come there they extract immense concessions from us and our companies when they try to do business in china but then they have free access and free reign in our markets. Oh, and by the way, like there's a whole bunch of our companies that they don't even like let in period. Um, and then on top of that, while they, when they want to come compete with us in something that's important, they just subsidize it from here to kingdom come yeah. and engage in anti-competitive price gouging in order to destroy the ability of other nations to compete in those critical sectors. And IP theft. Yeah, and and then IP theft on top of that, like they are not a good faith participant in free trade with the world, like at all, and they haven't been for a long time, and so it's not. But to their like, it, it, if you're sitting in, in their shoes, they're like, well, they're not enforcing any of this shit, so I'm just yeah. going to keep doing it. Why not? Why exactly. wouldn't you? Why? Yeah. yeah, like, oh, this is definitely in their best interest. They've been, you know, yeah. just. If I'm China, that's exactly what I do. We're excited about <laughs> yeah, how all of this is going. And so, you know, yeah. Trump began to shift the narrative on that in 2016. I think that's the reason that we got the IRA in the first place was because of the amount of awareness that got created around that subject that we really have got to do a better job when it comes to supply chain. Um, you know, both the the awareness that Trump provided on that during his presidency before COVID, but then especially COVID, like when COVID hit and everyone realizes, oh my gosh, like our interdependence on Chinese manufacturing and China just in general on a whole number of levels, like this is not healthy. So, you know, the, those two things combined created the political will to get something like the IRA done. But like I said, uh, half measures, too little, too late, not really going to move the needle. We need a much better much more overarching plan in order to reset and um, hopefully level the playing field moving forward. And then especially when it comes to not just next generation transportation systems like Tesla's working on, but especially when it comes to drones and AI and especially embodied AI through robotics like humanoid robots. I mean, if you've seen the uh, the Unitree B2, which is their knockoff version of the Boston Dynamics Spot robot, it's very intimidating because it's like 90% as good as Spot for like 5% of the cost. <laughs> and so they're just going to be able to go, you know, on a production rampage with this thing. And then you've got millions of these robots and you know that's the spot form factor but they'll be able to follow that with humanoid form factors they won't be as capable from a software standpoint as some of the things that we make here but they'll be able to make up for what the software lacks in volume like 80 20 six ways from sunday yeah and that plays itself out on multiple levels that plays itself out in their ability to add to gdp at levels that we can't compete with. It also plays itself out in military technology. Like if you can flood the battlefield with just way more robots that are way cheaper and 
they're maybe not as effective as the most effective thing that we have, but more than effective enough to overwhelm that in mass, then that's super scary. Um, so all of these things kind of add up. And, and I think this is maybe something that a few people that are really vigilant and watching the dynamics of the world understand this. I, I don't think that most Americans who now feel this kind of weight lifted off their shoulder and they feel some excitement around Trump, um, I don't think that they realize how significant profound. and important and profound this shift is in yeah. that dynamic specifically. I, I think I think that's incredibly well said. I think I think the I think I think more than we think do, but a majority definitely are more worried about inflation. They're yep. more worried about immigration. Like they're worried about like the stuff that normal people are worried about, right? Like people that are trying to live a good life and be happy. Not, not that there's any lesser or or better. That's just that's just what people are worried about. But I think our job, like you, you and I's job of like covering sort of the cutting edge of what the hell is happening in society kind of thing. Like it's so obvious that this is where it's going. And, and the more, the more, as you kept talking, the more that I think about it, how, how lucky is the United States to have the best technologist on the planet being a primary advisor to the president of the United States? Like literally the GOAT engineer technologist that's alive, that arguably could have ever been alive in Elon Musk. He's now a central person in, in helping the president of the United States understand what the hell is happening. I don't think, I, I think that is, people will dis, you know, like, you know, you see like the reports like first buddy, look at his first buddy. Oh my God, look at, they're just holding hands and kissing and all this shit, right? And I think, I think on the flip side, on the flip side, the concerns about, hey, Elon's not a, Nobody voted for Elon. How come he's having so much influence, right? Um, well, nobody voted for George Soros either. So if you want exactly. to make that argument, you've got to be fair with it. Yeah, and a cabinet is a cabinet, and an advisory board is an advisory board. To expect the, tr the president to operate alone is insane. However, I do think I do think it's always okay to have a level of skepticism. That's healthy. But the, yeah. the point I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make is this guy. This guy unequivocally is a gigantic asset for the United States that was completely and utterly mismanaged by the previous administration. They, they wasted four years of getting counsel from the guy that's at the forefront of what is going to happen in the world of artificial intelligence and robotics. And the fact that they actively demonized him in public is ridiculous right? and weaponize so, the unelected fourth branch of government in the yeah. bureaucratic administrative state to go after him six ways from sunday at the same time like i, yeah, I just can't insane. imagine the magnitude of the stupid own goal that that is yeah. um and imagine the 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 opportunity like like the opportunity loss if kamala would have won because th this would have never happened under kamala administration could they have like repaired their relationship somewhat? Sure. Would Elon have had the level of, let's say, influence or guidance? Zero percent chance. Like literally zero percent chance. So, yeah. so, so from that perspective, like him or dislike him, regardless of what you think about the person, he is at the forefront of these technologies. And to have his input and his counsel is going to be invaluable in America's ability to be relevant 20 years from now. This guy works 20 years in the future. Like, why wouldn't you want this guy helping you out? Like, I don't care if you dislike him. Fucking like use him. Use him. Like he's a he's a citizen. <laughs> use him. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're already collecting taxes from his businesses. You know, we should, we should, we should also leverage his expertise. You know, we should be open to it. I'm so and I'm so happy. And I'm so happy that the that the Trump administration is doing that because that's really going to set up. I really I feel very strongly that. The like between 2026 and 2028, because of these developments, like somewhere in the next two to four years, I think the overall level of confidence and how the world will think of the United States will shift dramatically towards the positive. They will, I think, they will they will see us um, as a not not as a failing nation, but as a revitalized nation. That's it, they're kicking ass. 
You know, they're kicking ass. It's just there's too many coinciding factors that, that I, I wrote a little expose a couple of days ago yesterday. Like the death of legacy media going to independent media, that's going to create way more diversity of thought and way more open media that's going to allow the public to be one, much more well informed and be able to identify bad things happening in society way sooner than they would have beforehand. Right. Then you have a, an administration coming in that is going to be really good with the economy, especially in comparison to the, the previous administration. Uh, just look at 2016 through 2020. The numbers are there. Trump is good with the economy. He's a lifelong businessman. I don't care what you think about him. It's just facts. Just look, literally just look at the numbers. You got unity, right? You got, you got the majority of the country gave a mandate. And so the roadblocks are not going to be there nearly as much. You got government efficiency kicking in. So the government's going to become way more responsive to the people, right? The, all these things are, are, are based on execution. Then you got artificial intelligence and human or robots coming in, freeing up people's time and massively increasing efficiency and massively increasing productivity, which will come with its host, own host of challenges. Like all of these are, all of these are like, and then America's 250th birthday in 2026, right? So you have all these like things coming together that create this like laser beam of progress, you know? And, and it all, and it all like, it all became a possibility after Trump got elected. It, there's so many underlying, uh, proofs that came out of that election that are that, that, that still haven't really thought through yet. But there's just so many underlying things that are now true that before many of us in independent media thought was happening, now th there's actual data that proves this is happening. And the long-term implications of it are incredibly positive. Yeah, I think that the long-term implications, like you said, are incredibly positive. I, I don't think that we're going to be able to execute on all of these things perfectly yeah, no in a super yeah. short period of time. So that fact means, you know, there's, there's going to be quite a large magnitude of noise around executing on all these things. Just, you know, transport yourself back in time a few short months ago to when Elon was first taking over Twitter before he turned it into X and like all of the noise that there was around that. And that was just like a very small version of what it is that this administration is going to try to do now for the entire United States. Um, so we're going to hear, you know, there's a lot more stakeholders that are very uh, incentivized to oppose the things that are going to be happening over the next 12 months, 24 months, four years. And their attacks are going to ramp up. So I I don't know when that overall vibe shift will like settle in to where it feels like, oh yes, actually, you know, everything that happened was largely positive. Um, I think we're going to have to get to the other side of a lot of noise. And, you know, hopefully we can avoid seeing any um, major security failures that lead to an assassination on you know any one of these major players in in this shift that's going on but yeah like the it's going to be wild but i do agree that you know once we get far enough on the other side of it it'll be clear to everyone that this was absolutely what was necessary that the goals were right that the team was prepared, they were equipped, and that they were able to make massive improvements in the system overall. I have a unrealistic take on what you just said. That I'm probably going to be wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway because I just I can't help but say it because it's manifest in my gut. it. Yeah, I'm going to manifest it. I think the noise will be a lot less than we think. I think the free market has spoken. And it has said that the old way of sharing information and what's actually happening is outdated and not only uh, useless, but borderline dangerous because of the amount of division it has fostered. And the public has realized that it's been an eye-opening moment for many. Again, I use the signal of MSNBC bringing on Trump as a giant shit. That it's, I, I know it's like one place. It cannot be understated just how big of a deal that is from like a vibe shift perspective where a hard left publication would be willing to talk to a Nazi, okay? Let's say. So that, I think what that's going to create a, 
is going to foster a sort of type of environment where there's going to be way more signal than noise. There's going to be way more factually true, actionable information that is not that is not driven to cater to an old way of making money, which is by uh, driving division. It's going to be driven towards being more centrist and being more factual and having conversations that might be controversial, but that are engaging, that people actually want, right? The, the Joe Rogan model, the Lex Friedman model, the Theo Vaughn model, the caller daddy model, like whatever you go through the list, right? Like the sit down and let's have a deep dive discussion about stuff, what, whatever that may, whatever that may mean in the, within the le- format of legacy media or independent media. And so I think what that's going to generate is that the amount of noise we'll see from this happening, which will, by default, this transition is going to be chaotic. But I think the public is going to be exposed to a lot more factual things than they would be noise, which is going to lower the hurdles just by default to get stuff done, uh, either from a buy-in perspective from the public or you know, behind the scenes, whatever, whatever needs to get done. Now that that might be a naive way of thinking about it, but I'm I'm still riding high on the fact that if the machine can lose, anything is possible. Yeah, anything well, is possible. <laughs> and we have seen great indications that you know their reach is plummeting. You know their ratings are getting eviscerated right now, just Down absolutely destroyed. Since the election. Yeah, so I mean that's yeah. kind of a big shift towards what you're saying. And and I think that is, you know, if, if we could just turn down the volume on corporate propaganda machine, then yeah, that reduces a lot of the noise because that's the source of most of that nonsense. Yeah. Um, I hope that's true. One thing that I will say just to, to zoom back out again to the larger overall trend. Um, I am, extremely excited now that we're at this inflection point where the podcast medium, the long form medium, the high context medium is taking over. And I think it's going to continue to take over and just become the dominant force in global politics. Um, I think the United States is kind of at the tip of the spear on this trend and it's going to continue really around the world. You know, the thing that corporate media really maximized for was entertainment value, which meant that everything got shorter and shorter. Like it was basically the, the TikTokification of public conversation around important topics before TikTok even existed. And yeah. it just fragmented our ability to make sense of the world and to think in coherent, logical, big picture ways. And podcasts are the exact opposite of that. It's like, let's go as deep as possible for as long as possible until we actually make all of the things fit together and make sense. And, you know, people don't just listen to one podcaster. They listen to lots of podcasters and they hear lots of different views. And then they kind of synthesize one big overarching grand story of what is going on from like hundreds of hours worth of conversations. And I think this is going to be a trend that really allows incredible politicians to rise to the surface at a level that we haven't seen in the past. And that, you know, obviously Donald Trump did a good job of taking advantage of the podcast medium this election. You know, he was really first to take full advantage of the Twitter medium back in 2016. And then this year he was uh, uh, at the Vanguard with podcasts as well. Thanks to his son um, pushing him. Like you need to get out here. You need to do this. Like nobody in our age group. Shout out bears. Yeah. Literally at all. What, you know, Fox and CNN and MSNBC has to say, like we're listening to Lex Friedman and Joe Rogan and all these other people. Like that's where you need to go win your audience. Uh, and when your voters... Hans, I have a secret. Baron tra- texted me. He said, this is his favorite podcast. Before I, oh, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Baron, if you're watching this for whatever reason. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, um, 
And that makes me really excited. I think that it actually signals really good things for the future. And I think that people like Vivek Ramaswamy, who would struggle more in the old system to break through. Like, I think that his level of outside success relative to what his prospects would have suggested already shows that he's a really promising candidate for the future. And I think him or someone like him really is the future of politics. JD. Well, and I, I think that JD's good, but at least for me, Vivek outshines JD significantly in those long mm-hmm. form podcasts. The JD is good and he's relatable. Um, but I think that Vivek does a better job of making complicated things simple. He's and more intellectual. More intellectual, but also I think Vivek does a better job of painting the positive vision of where we need to go as a nation. And and I think that's really where this is going to end up. Like To be able to make sense of the big story, crystallize it down into something that people can understand in a few hour conversation, and then sell them the vision of what we could be moving forward. I think he's the best of all of the millennial politicians out there on those three dimensions. And, And I think that you know, if it, unless there are some unforeseen major factors that I am missing, that he's going to become the shining star of American politics over the next couple decades. Yeah, I think I think I definitely agree with you. The I think I also heard that on the uh, trigger trigonometry guys were talking about that, like the the podcast format. If given that that will become the primary way by which people will make decisions on who the right candidate is instead of these god awful debates and you know uh uh rapid fire bullshit things that we have to deal with that we have had to deal with no longer anymore um by default that's going to filter to a person who has depth who has understanding deep understanding of the topics who and who is able to either be comfortable in their own skin or be a next level narcissist and lie to the public for hours on end, sitting down in front of a camera uh, as an actor, let's say, right? Like that, th- those are the only two outcomes. We're either going to get the and that's ultimate really hard to do. I mean, that that's is really hard to, hard to do. Yeah. And that's one thing humans do really well is like we have, if you give us enough time to scope somebody out, well, like our gut will do it automatically. Like, yeah, the wisdom of crowds about will it. sniff that out. Yeah, like like that, super quick. So it it, it just it has so many different positives. I do agree with you. I I do think the so so the question becomes like on the Republican side, we see those people. The Democrat side hasn't embraced that yet, but they have to and they will. I'm like 100 percent sure. Eventually. I mean, I hope they embrace it. <laughs> I don't know that it's going to be anytime soon. I think they're going to be behind the curve by a long shot. Um. You don't think in 2028 they'll try to uh, like uh, they'll move in that direction, alter. but like you know, Vivek doesn't just burst onto the scene as this person because there was an overnight vibe shift. Like Vivek has been brewing yeah. as a personality for a decade and some change. Like all of the things that he went through, building his company, then having to resign from his company because it got you know, captured by wokeness and like he, he literally built this thing and then got kicked out as the founder CEO because he wanted to speak out about politically hot topics. Yeah. That type of courage, like you have to have those types of crucible moments to form someone like Vivek. And there's like those crucible moments are ahead of us for the democratic party they're not behind us like i mean this last election was kind of one but people were really sleeping through it and we we don't see at this point the the type of clear thinking and principled actions that um really show us who those people are going to be yet so so i think that there's still some time like they are going to have to face some adversity for a few more years before that adversity can produce the types of 
qualities in a in a candidate that we're talking about. Um, yeah. To switch back for just a second to the you know one of the differences between the two models, like how much of what is so annoying and distasteful to most people about Donald Trump were literally just features that he had to develop in order to win in the legacy media, you know, corporate media format. Like those crappy debates that you're talking about that are so awful and so uninformative. And they're literally just like, like the best way to win them is to be the most ridiculous roast comic. Like, yeah, that a lot of those things are the things that turn people off to Trump. But like, how does a politician in 2012, 2016, in a post internet, but pre podcast political landscape, how do they win? Like you, you, yeah. you kind of have to lean into some of those dynamics. And, and I think that we're going to be moving out of that phase and that era, like over, we already have, and it's just going to continue to get more and more minimized over time. Yeah. Tony Hinchcliffe, uh, definitely missed the boat on being the next president because yeah. he's Too the young. greatest roast comet of all time. And he would have been, he would have been the, he would have won the popular vote by 80%. <laughs> Too late now, Tony. Sorry. The podcast era is here. Actually, no, he's, I love Tony. He's the best. Um, the, yeah, dude, it's, it, I, I would be, I would be surprised. I mean, I agree with you. I think what's interesting about the Democrat party is like, they are, they are the machine personified. They are the definition of the machine. And so by, by default, for them to become non-machine and innovate internally, what's, so I think, I think I agree with you then. I think it's going to take one or two political cycles, one or two presidential cycles for them to shed the machine and become a new party. And what my gut is telling me, this is what my gut is telling me. I think that the Democrat party, they will speak directly to the people that will be disrupted by artificial intelligence. I think that's going to be their new branding in the next eight to 12 years. The Andrew Yangs and the Dean Phillips of the world can, can become the face of the new liberals. Yeah. I think I, I think that is the kind of vibe I'm getting because at that point, you know, if you really think through it, in that kind of uh, po- post uh, scarcity world, uh, not requiring humans to do physical or digital labor. That's where every, you know, but I, I, I don't. I, I, I think the Republican Party will be the the party of progress and technology, and which is such a crazy thing to think through. Progress, technology. Leveraging artificial intelligence, balls to the wall, maximum, maximum improvement for everybody. Just disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. And then the Democrat Party is going to be, you are leaving a wake of destruction behind you by displacing humans left and right. And we're doing nothing to make sure that these people, these human beings are treated with respect and are, and, and have meaning and value. And a future that can be hopeful for because now they've lost all meaning. That's what I that's what I see coming down the pike. I think I think it, it will naturally appear on the Democrat side. And and as I think an that will speak to a lot. Yeah. Sorry? As an opposition. As an opposition. I think that's yeah. inevitable. Yeah. That's inevitable. Unless unless we're somehow in a world where the disruption from artificial intelligence is not as large as I think it's gonna be. By default, the transitionary period is going to be massive for us to get to the other side. Um, I don't see a world where, and, and so here, here's the opposite side, right? What's interesting about the time that we're in now is like the, if you just think about Doge specifically, government efficiency, one of the positive byproducts of government, government efficiency, it's not a byproduct, it's a feature really, is that it will become a lot more responsive to the will of the people. If the people are suddenly being disrupted by artificial intelligence, it's not going to be, hopefully, it's not going to be the situation where NAFTA came to fruition, all these manufacturing jobs went overseas, and it left thousands of towns barren and destroyed and overrun with drugs because they've lost all meaning and purpose and their towns got decimated. And the government was super slow to react because the government was built out of elites and they didn't respond to the public. They just cared about getting more power and pleasing their donors, right? In theory, with a more efficient government, the people will be more capable of driving change from a government policy perspective 
which could dramatically lessen the impact of displacement from artificial intelligence. And the government can actually figure out how to make the transition more palatable and, and better for the public. So that is one positive thing that could happen where this doesn't pan out. But if that is not executed at a high level, and say by 2030, 2032, the, you know, Elon is on Mars and is like, I'm not, I, I can't worry about the government anymore. I got to build a freaking thing on Mars, right? Then um, how, how are we sure that the, the, the progress that we're on, it, it's got uh, to be a push and pull, right? Right now we're pushing because we've been pulling for way too long. But at some point that pushing is going to be too far and we need to bring it back. So I, 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 think that's, I think that's what's going to happen. You're muted. I don't know if your line got cut out or... Can't hear you. How about now? Yes, sir. There we go. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple of important things that are attached to that. One of them is that, you know, the government its power is essentially a wealth redistribution power and it should be correlated with the need in a society for wealth distribution. Um, but that's wealth distribution by force. So one of the, the questions is, can we do a better job moving forward of redistributing wealth in a way that does a good job of uplifting the poor and you know those who are most vulnerable in our societies voluntarily instead of having to have that be by force that would be one positive way that we could potentially avoid some of these pitfalls if we can't do that voluntarily there absolutely will be a you know massive public outcry that does demand that it be accomplished by force and those are always very chaotic times in human history when we get to that point. So that's going to be one dynamic to watch. Um, the other thing that scares me about the left end of the political spectrum really becoming the opposition party to the, you know, the, the tech machine that creates a lot of abundance um is that they're the group of people i think least equipped to like what you're talking about there is is a meaning void that yes if, if we have all of the things that we want provided to us essentially then how do we as humans find meaning and that's not usually something that progressives are extremely capable of helping people to work out like humans pretty much figured out how to maximize living a meaningful life a long time ago since we've been around a long time and most of the wisdom you know whether or not you agree with whole cloth any of the major religions um I think it's pretty hard to argue that they haven't already codified the, all of the major pillars necessary for a human to lead a meaningful life and to derive meaning from the life that they live. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much something that is abandoned by, you know, progressives want to leave that in the past. They don't want to take that forward with them. They want to just have the freedom to create talking about the role of religion specifically in shaping meaning in no, well it doesn't like, so or faith or some sort I, of I like, would say uh, religions guidebook. and faith have done a great job of figuring out those things but then they can just be uh instantiated in a culture so you know the a lot of people like richard dawkins who's an atheist will say that he's a cultural christian and so he he believes in a lot of the same values that were developed through different religious and faith systems over time. And he, so like the, you don't have to necessarily adhere to a faith to embrace the values of things that just, you know, human wisdom that has been developed, honed and refined over thousands and thousands of years. But 
the leading edge of progressivism abandons all that. They they like just want to say, hey, let's figure it all out. We're going to throw everything that we figured out up to this point away and figure it all out from scratch. And you know, they they throw the baby out with the bathwater more often than not when they do that. And so if those are the people that are then in the primary position of proposing, okay, how do we figure out how to make meaning now? And we're just going to like, we have every, and it'll be super tempting to say, okay, now that we have anything and everything we could possibly want, well, all of the human wisdom that we figured out up until this point in time, like we can throw that out too, because all that wisdom was meant for a world where we didn't have all this stuff. Now that we have all this stuff, we just got to start from scratch and figure it all out. And uh, yeah. I think that that's going to be a human meaning catastrophe. Yeah, I I view it differently. I think I think that's those are really good call outs. I I view it from the perspective of as somebody who considered himself a Democrat, somebody that I still view myself as a left of center person. I think the one thing the left does really well in its best form is they're very empathetic. They have a lot of empathy for their fellow human. Not that the right doesn't. I think I think one of the one of the things about the the right is that they are more they value independence and they value family and they value freedom very very highly. Not to say that they're not empathetic to their to their fellow human beings, but I think one of the one of the things that I've that I associate with the good parts of the left is that I think they are inherently extremely empathetic people. They're much more about the art of life than the then I, I would say that the other side of the political spectrum. And from that perspective, the, the way I view that is in a best case scenario for that type of uh, side of the political aisle, I think they would be, I would argue, very well suited to help people navigate or to create a a government like a foundational system of sorts from a government perspective, to transition people away from the you know the age of work to the age of abundance, so I think you know I, I and, but I totally get your your fear because the trend from the last twenty to forty years shows that if you let them let them really go to the maximum, you end up with this insanity. But I would argue the same thing happens on the right. If you let them go hardcore, you end up with zealotry. You know, they both end up with yeah. zealotry. You know? Yeah, if, if you go to the worst ends of either one, obviously. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I kind of agree and I kind of disagree. And I'll make a distinction here. And yeah. maybe that will clarify some things. So I think the best version of progressive values and the best version of conservative values can actually both be defined as empathy yeah. but the progressive values would be short-term empathy and the conservative version would be long-term empathy that it's important you know that when you think about things like family values or community or freedom like those are values that the right has high confidence will lead to the best outcomes for the most people over a long period of time. That in the short term, it seems messy, it seems chaotic, it oftentimes is uncomfortable, but if you will just give it time, that it will produce the best outcomes versus a lot of times the the short-term empathy, like, and I, I can just say that at least in my own life, in my own experience, there have been a number of times when I have felt tremendous empathy for a person and I've really tried to help them. And I've let my desire to help them as much as possible right here and right now in the short term. I have done things that felt good in the moment, but then with the benefit of hindsight and wisdom, actually, I realized was harmful to them. Yeah. And I think that that trap isn't just one that we face as individuals. I think it's also one that we face as societies. And that's the thing. Like, if we're talking about redefining 
the way that humans derive their sense of meaning for millennia into the future, yeah. potentially. A short-term empathy-driven motivation is not likely to produce the durable long-term correct solutions. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a very fair point. Um, I, I think what it highlights is just how like that is going to happen. I think I think that's that's what that's what it highlights me more. Like that's my biggest takeaway from here is like this is going to be a legitimate environment we're going to find ourselves in in probably no less than ten years, like no more than ten years. By the end of twenty, by the end of the twenties into the early thirties, this is going to become a it's going to be become a forefront conversation for politics. I, I believe in the United States specifically, really any country that's undergoing massive disruption from automation, artificial intelligence. Again, like the concept of abundance is fantastic, but who gets it? How fast they get it? And what at what level do they get it? At what price do they get it? Uh, how excessive? Like how often can they get it? Right. So it's like there's like there's all these. Well, like, and the flippers. relative amounts are going to be exactly. super important. Like, does yeah. this person get it to like a hundred x more than the person literally right next to them? That disparity will drive very difficult dynamics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's almost like. Yeah, it's it's so crazy, right? Because it, God, it's like unbelievable. So if everyone like like the way I conceptualize this is if everyone has access to what everyone has now, the, if everyone has access in twenty years to what the richest people in our society have have access now today, right? So if everyone if everyone's standard of living <laughs> is raised to today's elites, what where are the elites, right? Are the on elites Mars- going to be? On Mars, <laughs> I doubt it. No, they're gonna send us. They're gonna send the rest of us to Mars. <laughs> we're not gonna keep the nice planet. Y'all, y'all guys can fuck up. Go on the red one. You know, I think, I think the that's where finite resources become insanely valuable. Insanely valuable land, specific yep. like land, real estate, like where you live. Well, okay, so. The question becomes like, how much will technology improve our ability to to like terraform or change the landscape on on Earth right now to be habitable, right? So like almost free energy, almost free transportation, almost free labor. Does that mean now like the Rockies are now going to be like habitable by most people, or like you know uh, parts of the of the world that? Traditionally, is not developed because of how difficult it is to get sh- to get shit there, and to get water there, and to get yeah, like, power there. You literally, know? Antarctica and the North Pole will become, yeah, great places to live. You know, if assuming that we can colonize and terraform Mars, like if we can do that, then the parts yeah. of our planet that are really uncomfortable and difficult to deal with right now, well, those will be a cakewalk. So, so I'm willing to bet those will come first. They're going to be yeah, proving like, grounds. We got to figure out how to do it there. Yeah. Before we can really do it elsewhere. Exactly. Um, you know, they're going to make a, a, a fully self-sustaining uh, livable space in the middle of the Sahara desert and in the middle of the, of the South pole. And it's going to be perfectly climate controlled. It's going to be a, an AI human or robot heaven. Uh, it's going to have simulated weather inside. It's going to be stupid. It's going to be insane. And it's possible 1,000% once you make the price of energy and labor basically free. Yep. Anything is possible at that point. Um, so that that will take a while. So Okay, so so maybe I'm not... Okay. Maybe, maybe this is more like an after I'm dead thing. <laughs> you know, because the path from here to there seems long now. The more I think about it, yeah, the, pa- I the, mean, the path the alone is completely and totally sandbagging when he says that there's going to be a bot for every human. There's going to be 10 bots like or 100 bots yeah. or 1,000 bots per every human. Why would you stop? Is it going to turn into like that wait but why story of the of the uh, 
of the machine <laughs> making uh but was it paper clips Bots are going to be the paper clips yeah they're just going to take <laughs> yeah. over <laughs> It's like, oh, we need more bots. Okay, let's break down the carbon from humans so we can make more bots. Okay, here we go. Hello. Yep. You are having been identified as carbon for the next robot. Congratulations. I can get shot in the head. <laughs> <laughs> Laser beam like breaks down all your atoms. God, yeah. Maybe I, maybe I don't want to be around for that. Maybe I don't want to be around for that. I don't know. Yeah, what, what, a, what a future. And it's, you know, previously... Again, like if I sort of circle back to where we started, as scary as this future feels and sounds, how is this not the inevitable place we're going to end up as a species? It totally is. Oil, I mean, without a doubt. Short of if, if we and don't, ocean. yeah, yeah. But the have, risk of that has gone down dramatically. I would argue. Hopefully, uh, and I agree. So one of the things get John Bolton out of there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So I want to just caveat this and say, like, I recognize that there are concerns with, you know, Elon has a lot of vested interests in both China and the United States. 100%. Maybe there's some conflicts there. Like, this is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. But I think on balance, I'm really excited that Elon is going to be helping to navigate this Cold War 2.0 tension between the United States and China moving forward that, you know, unlike the presidents who are going to come and go, as long as he stays alive and healthy, he's going to be a stabilizing force over decades with strong presence in China, strong presence in the United States, and this stated overarching goal of making humanity sustainably multiplanetary that if we can guide the efforts of the United States and China towards a positive sum, let's expand out to the stars instead of fight each other over slices of land here on earth. That's a much better possible future than the one where we go to war over Taiwan and nuke the entire world. And his ability to have conversations with Xi, like, you know, there's only two people in the world who have a record of being able to go toe to toe with the CCP in negotiations and come out on top. And those two people are Elon Musk and Donald Trump. And after Donald Trump, leaves the White House, well, then we'll still have Elon Musk. And the I don't think with the right incentives and the right philosophies that it will be particularly difficult to manage Cold War 2.0 um, in a positive direction for humanity. But it does take a different, like, people with the human extinctionist philosophy underpinning their worldview, like those are not going to be those people. Those people are going to just sleepwalk us into death species level annihilation. Yeah. Yeah, Like hundred percent because that's subconsciously what it is that they want. Um, So you can't have anyone like that who is a major determining factor in how those conversations go. Um, You need someone who legitimately has the best of aspirations for the Chinese people and the best of aspirations for the West. And then you need lots of leverage. And I mean, this is another, like, I think people underestimate how inevitable it was that Elon was going to have to get extremely political. Like the scope of his ambition, like you don't get to settle another planet without being (laughs) more powerful than every other nation on earth. And if you're more powerful than every other nation on earth, what can you not avoid ever? Politics, like, and not just politics at a small scale, like politics at the entire international level so 
yeah. <clears throat> and and like I said, on balance, I think that Elon is a better person in that role than anyone else that I can think of. Like he's actually competent enough to be able to run the experiments. Like I don't think anyone, any human alive can know with clarity beforehand exactly how we need to move forward over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. The only way that we're going to be able to navigate that extremely razor edge thin pathway that doesn't descend into global annihilation is by doing all of the experiments necessary to get the data to make the right decision at the right moment. And that's something that he's incredibly good at. And so I, I think that it's pivotal that him, people like him, people that have been trained up under his management are in the positions to make those world altering decisions. And I think we'll see that because with government now becoming a place where truly talented, forward-thinking, disruptive forces can now become, they can actually do stuff now, um, especially if the execution comes in at a high level in the next two to four years, I think people that should be in government will actually end up being in government. And we will start getting the things that we need in place for it to be a long-term stable force for good versus what we've had in the past. Just something as simple as term limits for Congress is going to be so massive. Something as simple as, I don't know, maybe we need to make an amendment that says that you can't just print money to freaking cover your deficit. You have to balance your budget. Like you have to balance your fucking budget. And if you don't do it, cut something. And if you can't raise enough revenue, figure out how to raise more or like, like just fix it, fix the problem. Or make, make the thing that you're having to provide cost less. Like, yeah, there's, there's exactly. so many options. Innovate, disrupt, like, bro, this is how the world works, yep. you know? And the government for way too long, they've had this like safety blanket and just printing money because they're the world's reserve currency. And to think that this is like, I've had people that I've had lit people literally tell me that there's no long-term consequence to this because devaluing the money doesn't matter if you're the world's reserve currency. I'm like, are you even listening to yourself talk right? Like, how, how, how do you think in any planet that devaluing the, ba the currency? How, how many world's of, currencies still exist today that tried that experiment? Yeah. <laughs> well, this time is different, Hans. Come on now. Every time. Yeah. Okay. Should we leave it there? That, that, I think I think that's a very good place. That was that's good. Yeah. Phenomenal. I had so much fun with this one. Oh my god. That was awesome. Perfect.